Um, all right, let's see. Hey, do you guys, um, did you guys ever, ever watch The Brady Bunch? Yes. No way. That many of you know The Brady Bunch? That is so <laughs> random. Six seasons of it. So you know Marsha, Marsha, Marsha? Yeah. Marsha, Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Is that right? Yeah. Because uh, today we're going to study Martha, so we call it Martha, 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 right? In fact, Jesus even says it, so, but we'll get there. But before we get there, uh, I want to share a brief story with you. I always say it's going to be a short teaching, and it never is, huh? I really feel like seriously, we got like four verses today, right? But um, I was going to tell you a quick story about this guy who has since gone on to be with the Lord. His name was Ed, Ed Thompson. And he's a funny story because he came to Christ real late in life. Um, I would call him perhaps the most selfish Christian I ever knew in my life. He, um, he had, he, by the time he got saved, he was probably in his 60s, and he acted like he was in his 80s. He was a Vietnam vet that had been through real hard times, had been a party guy most of his life, had never got married, never had kids. Well, that's not totally true. As it turned out later on in life, he found out he had a kid. And they, and they, like, reunited and whatever. But basically, my point is, he'd lived his whole life in his own little world, right? And it really made him quite a character. But he ended up, at the end of his life, living in the low-income housing right up the street here, lonely. And he kind of got turned on to community for the first time in his life, community that wasn't, like, centered around cocaine and alcohol, but was just, like, family. Like, and we sort of became his family. And so at least every year or so, we'd piss him off and he'd quit the church, right, you know. But then he'd realize he had nowhere else to go, so he'd come back. But he was, he was a classic guy because he ended up being with the church maybe for, I don't know, almost 10 years of his life. And slowly, slowly but surely began to sort of grasp, oh, Christian living, like having grace forgiving people when they, I think he'd grown, you know, he'd lived his life where if like if you offended him, he just wrote you off and then went off, you know, never, he never really had to like live in community where you had like, do you guys know anything about living in community? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. Like learning how to like give people the benefit of the doubt, have grace for people, forgive people, all these things. But he was a classic, what you call a cumbrudgeon, like, bah, 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 and, he, and he actually kind of talked, you remember Ed, you remember Uncle Ed? And he kind of talked like that, right? But here's what was funny. So a couple funny things about him. This guy, um, this local guy, was a local pig hunter, would pick up Ed at Ed's house at like 6.30 in the morning, and they'd come to church together, and Ed's kind of quasi-job was to fix the chairs, right? And he would always complain to me, I don't know why I, I like, this guy's name was Cola, that would pick him up. Cola picks me up so early, I have to get up at 5.30 on Sundays. And I would say to him, Ed, but you don't work. <laughs> like, you get up one morning a week at 5.30 to come do your little service. You can go home and take a nap. And then you could actually sleep in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You could get, like, you've got all week to catch up. He goes, I know, but I still, it ruins my whole day. It messes my whole day up to have to get up this early. So, all right, Ed. But anyways, he would, he would do it. He'd show up. But this is what would happen. So, if you know me, if you guys come early... Who comes early? Where's Nick? Nick comes sometimes. Sunday. I get to church about 4.30 on Sunday mornings, and I hang out with the Lord, and then, like, Conrad shows up, and we set up the church. And here's what would happen. Before there was Conrad, there was this other guy named Steve. So we get there real early. Uh, Steve would show up maybe 5.30 or 6, and we'd spend about an hour setting up the church, and then we'd sit down, and we would fold the bulletins. And after we folded the bulletins, we'd kind of sit and just chat. And sure enough, like clockwork, Right about the time Steve and I would finish folding the bulletins and we'd sit back to chat, Ed would show up with cola. And this is what Ed would say as he'd walk into church. He'd look at us and he'd go, well, it's nice. Some people have time to just sit around and talk. Others have work to do. <laughs> right? But the funny part about the story was he was serious. Like, he wasn't just, like, trying to get our goat or whatever. He was serious. He would seriously walk in and think, look at you lazy sacks. You know, I got work to do because all he could see... It was him and all his hard work. He couldn't, didn't notice that maybe we had already been working for hours setting up the church. Why am I telling you that story? Because Martha, Martha, Martha. Ed would say, you guys should stop talking and get to work. And it sounds a bit like Martha. Okay, so uh, on Tuesday, we talked about the Good Samaritan story. 
um, which actually began with a question from a lawyer. We had an explanation on eternal life. I thought you guys find that interesting. We talked about like what did Old Testament people believe about what happens after death. And um, yeah, I just want to wrap up with, uh, the Good Samaritan story with this. It serves two purposes for us. One, the obvious one is this is how we are to love people. This is how God loves us. Therefore, go and do the same. Um, but the second purpose of the story is sort of the sheer impossibility of it. Um, the guy that like, um, the guy who helps out the, Samar uh, the Samaritan that helps out the Jewish guy actually gives up what turns out to be probably two months salary, right, to help him out, which is kind of setting the bar really high for That's okay, because um, um, it's about how we live our life of Christ. Uh, let him live it through. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and script the rest of that. Good Samaritan thing, because we covered that already, and blah, 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 blah. So once again today, could be a short lesson. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, the reason why it's going to be a short lesson is um, next week, whenever I teach, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer. And I'm like super amped um, to teach the Lord's Prayer. Um, because uh, I started praying through the Lord's Prayer every day, I don't know, about maybe 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. And it's like the prayer that is only like an inch long and a mile deep, yeah? The more I pray through the Lord's Prayer, the more God reveals stuff to me about the Lord's Prayer. And I'm really, really looking forward to teaching it to you. I don't even know if we'll get through it um, in one sitting next week. There's so much to, to talk about. It. What's that? Yeah, Lord's Prayer is, is awesome. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But I think it's going to make a lot of sense. Because I've been thinking about it a lot. So, okay. Okay, so um, tonight is the, the famous Mary and Martha story. It's a famous story. Uh, I call it an easy devotional application. You know, you know, I read the Daily Bread every day just for laughs because it's so cheesy, right? You guys ever? Super cheesy. And they probably use the once a year, if not like multiple times a year. An easy story. Um, it fits well in the context of the previous story, which was about the Good Samaritan. A story about loving one's neighbor as evidence of your love for God. To today's story, which is about making God. We're going from a story where your love for God is evidenced in how you love other people to today's story about the importance of loving God as your first priority. Okay, um, and then the time frame on all this uh, um, where it shows up here in the book of Luke is actually kind of murky and kind of inconsistent. So it appears, the reason why I say that is Luke purposely put this story here, probably because of the context of the story of the Good Samaritan. Does that make sense? Because otherwise it doesn't make chronological sense that Jesus would be in Bethany for today's story. So... It's probably related to the Good Samaritan story thematically just because of what I told you. So let's pick up the story. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Okay, so um, most everybody agrees the house in Bethany where Martha lived with Mary and who else? Anybody? Hey, you guys are good. Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, probably brothers and sisters. And the reason why this story doesn't, shouldn't fit here chronologically is technically they should still be back down around Jericho somewhere. When you go with me to Israel, you'll see they haven't probably gone up the hill yet. So this probably actually happens at a later date because it was really just like a quick walk to Jerusalem. So remember like when Jesus entered and he has his moment at the temple, whether he's like throwing over the tables or just dismissing it. And then he turns to everybody and goes, oh, let's go to Lazarus's house, right? So it was easily a quick walk from Jerusalem. You could just walk over to Bethany to their house. So that's why I say it's chronologically probably out of order. Now, just so you know, out of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, uh, Martha's probably the older sister because it's called her house. Yeah. And by the way, her name, Martha, actually means head of the house, like she's the mistress, head of the house. Yes? I don't know. Good question. He's probably the younger brother is my guess, yeah? And I don't, and I don't know. Wouldn't it be the brother's household? You'd think, yeah. 
you'd think. Maybe he lives somewhere else. Maybe he, li- maybe he has his own house. That's the only thing I can think of, right? Maybe this perspective is just Martha's perspective. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, they, they um, yeah, opened her home to him, and her name means head of the house. So go figure. I don't know. It's a good question, Maddie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Okay, so let's pick it up. Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, um, there's no evidence to support that this is Mary Magdalene. In fact, it's probably impossible for her to be both uh, Mary Magdalene and Lazarus' sister. But the most important thing about this little thing here is she was sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to what he said. Now, why is that important? Um, because sitting at the Lord's feet and listening, those words, that verbiage, is normally what it would say about a rabbi and his official disciples. Why is this a big deal? 21st century Christians? is because traditionally those disciples would all be men. What she's actually doing is something that a man would normally do. Now, we discussed earlier on in the book of Luke Um, that out of all the four Gospels, Luke's account is the most quote-unquote feminist account. It gives a lot of credibility to the women over and over, shows all kinds of examples where women were doing things with Jesus that normally weren't acceptable for women to do. And here is an example. She is acting like a disciple by sitting at his feet. Again, the Greek verbiage is what a disciple would say. For example, um, it says about... Um, Akuo Lagos means listening to his words. Um, Akuo, which is a deeper than um, just sort of listening, infers that she is paying deep attention to his capital W word. Um, in fact, um, wait, where did I? Th- oh, I do have it there. Um, remember um, that word. Hearing, we've been, ha- we've been using it a lot lately. Uh, remember when I taught you about the, um, uh, the four soils? And the one thing that linked all the four soils together was the word hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them listen. And it goes over and over and over, yeah. Um, and then Jesus right after that says, no, let me tell you. They say your mother and brothers are waiting outside. And he said, my mother and brothers are those who hear my words, right? And then let him who has ears to hear, it's all that same word, akuo. And now Mary is doing exactly that. She's listening to his word. And by the way, Cooper, um, John MacArthur was frothing over the fact that Mary was listening to the word. He's given it the capital W and he kind of went off on a full tangent about Everybody needs to listen. This is why we read the word and, you know, da 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 We should all be like Mary. Pay attention to the Bible and scripture and get it, the word. Are you with me? Okay, so Martha gets kind of bummed in verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, I said bummed, but what's the actual word? Distracted. Distracted. This, by the way, is the key word to today's teaching, yeah? Uh, First of all, let's have, as I like to do, let's have a moment of grace, a moment of mercy for for Martha, 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 Martha. Uh, First of all, probably a lot of people, like a lot of people probably showed up. It wasn't just like, oh, hey, Jesus, come on in. No, there's like all the 12 disciples, all the women that were with him. You've all watched The Chosen, right? There's like a mob of people, and there's very likely a mob of people just following Jesus around Bethany, there are feet that need to be washed and food that needs to be cooked. So here's the point. The problem is not that she's busy serving the Lord. The issue is this key word that makes Martha's behavior less sort of um, good, as to, for lack of a better word, than Mary's, and it is the word distracted, which, by the way, and every translation I could find it used the word distracted except King James that used the word she was cumbered I'm not even sure what cumbered means like encumbered encumbered like like to bear a weight or whatever this and that yeah but um, the word distracted in the Greek is peri spao peri from above around or over and um, spao means occupied she was over occupied uh, Martha's lost all her joy 
um, in the busyness of doing what needs to be done. And um, in ministry, we call this losing the plot. Actually, I'm not sure if we call that in ministry. I call that in ministry because it's a term that I stole from my Australian surf buddies when I used to live with Australians. They would say, I might, I think you've lost the plot, right? What does that mean, lost the plot? Anybody? Missing the point, right. Like losing sight of like what's really going on here. Um, I wrote in my notes here to tell you uh, um, an example of a guy that was a worship leader that I might have shared this story with some of you worship leaders before. But I had a, um, a guy that used to lead music on Sunday mornings at church, and he was a real perfectionist. And he really, he was actually easily, he was easily the most talented musician at the church. And he played in a professional country band he was like the country band on the island. So if somebody was going to have a square dance, it was his band, right, you know? And he was like the country singer. But he was a total perfectionist. But you, what used to drive me nuts about him was this is what he would do. He'd be up on stage on Sunday morning, you know, and he would be playing and da-da-da, and he's singing, and he's listening, and somebody in the band would make a mistake, and he'd give him a dirty look. He'd be like... And then he'd turn, he'd go, and he'd, he'd like, look at the congregation, like, and then <laughs> he starts singing. And I'd go to him after church, and I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> like, I think you're missing the idea of, like, what we're supposed to be doing. We're, we're leading the congregation in, like, the worship of God in heaven. And if somebody makes a mistake, that's okay. And when you give a dirty look, or he would even sometimes, like, complain to the sound guy, Hey, I can't hear my guitar. Could you? I, okay, well, uh, we'll just, and he'd say stuff like, we'll just try to keep going. <laughs> like that. Wow. Isn't that awkward? Right? How long was he in the worship? He got better. He was with us for a long time, actually. And he didn't do it all the time. But I would have to work with him. And guess what I would talk to him about? Like, I would literally say, you've lost the plot. I think you're missing the point of what's going on here. I admire that you want the music to be good, but it's not about the music, right? Um, and I know that sounds obvious, but I've seen other scenes. Believe, oh, you guys have all probably, you guys grew up in the church. You've probably all seen stuff like this. I've seen um, um, people snapping out in the kitchen because we were having some thing we're feeding you know, we're maybe the Thanksgiving feed, we're going to, you know, we're going to feed 400 poor people, and there's people in the kitchen going, that's not how that's supposed to go, and da 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 and you know, everybody's all mad, and we're, we ran out, you use too much sour cream, now we don't have, now we don't, okay, people just won't have sour cream, you know, <laughs> and you're going, hey, <laughs> like, you understand, like, what we're trying to do here, the family coming together to feed poor people, right? Or I can, you guys all know Joe McAvoy, don't you? He's, a, you know, you know, Joe, you got, you know Joe McAvoy. Joe, Joe McAvoy is one of our elders. He's the financial elder. And bless his heart, he's a businessman. And he's a very, very successful businessman. And he has done wonders with our church, getting us, like, in line financially. We used to waste all kinds of money. And Joe came in and organized it, categorized everything, made budgets for everybody. But you know what he can't get out of his head is we're not doing this to make money, right? And so he'll be like, but if you just give that money, da da da, then that money's lost. <laughs> and Rick and I will be like, uh huh. <laughs> and he's like, but there's no return. And we're like, uh huh. <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah. And then he'll get it. He'll like really get it. He'll be like, oh yeah. Like the church, we're not, the church doesn't exist to make money, right? We're, we exist to do ministry. And ministry is pretty much a losing game. You spend money, it's pretty much gone, right? You buy something for the junior high group and, right? It's gone, yeah? So anyway, so losing the plot. Now, here's where it gets really interesting is what she says next. So the rest of verse 40, Martha came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care uh -oh, that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? And then I love this one. Tell her to help me. Okay, first of all, <laughs> Lord, don't you care? When's the last time we heard this? We heard it fairly recently. Does anybody remember? In the boat. Remember in the boat when they were, thought they were going to drown and they woke him up and what did they say? Master, don't you 
air that we're going to drown. Now, by the way, um, Cooper, MacArthur says this. This is one of the most foolish and graceless statements ever made to Jesus. To, get, to be fair, MacArthur says he's not picking on Martha specifically, but when anybody says to Jesus, don't you care? <laughs> because you see the irony of telling, or do you see the irony of asking Jesus, don't you care? Like the very fact that Jesus is actually here <laughs> on the planet, not like ruling from heaven on his throne in glory, shows more care and concern than any human being ever has on the planet, right? So, must have been kind of close to be brave enough to do that. You'd think so. They were probably very familiar. And this, by the way, Martha saying to him, don't you care, is part of what I would call losing the plot. Now, granted, she to have mercy on her, she doesn't know the whole plot. They've discussed the idea that he's the Messiah, but what that exactly means is really unclear. Like, I don't even think that once people understood that Jesus was the Messiah, they understood that he was divine. Does that make sense? That he was actually div divinity, like deity. Does that make sense? Like, the Messiah, God's son, could mean like, it means the anointed one. Doesn't necessarily mean he is God. He, at this point, he's just a powerful guy, right? But here's what's really funny, is when she says, um, she instructs God what he ought to do if he really cared. I hope you all see the humor in that. God, if you really cared, you'd do what I want you to do, right? Like not only accusing God of not caring, but pretty much telling God how to do it. Which, by the way, just so you know, I'm guilty of these very same things. When I pray for people and I cry out to God, I have to be careful that I keep my heart in check and I'm not accusing God of not caring as I tell him what I think he ought to be doing, right? You ever pray like that? God, why don't you do this? And then you're like, you know what, God? Actually, do whatever you think <laughs> you ought to do because I don't know. It seems to me like this is what ought to happen, but you're God. You ought to figure it out. So this is what's comical to me. Martha thinks that if Jesus really cared, he would tell Mary to do what she wants Mary to do, right? Okay. Now, the reason why I think that's particularly funny to me is because I've been a pastor for 25 odd years. Oh, you've had people come to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, people come to me more frequently than you want to know about. Usually it's about their spouse, you know? And sometimes they'll even try to set me up. Well, you know, Dane, do you think God would want somebody to do this and be righteous? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. And do you think God would want someone to blah, blah, blah? And I'd be like, yeah, that seems to be a thing. Well, then, you need to go tell my husband, <laughs> right, or my wife. Then go tell my wife that she's, she's got to change, right, you know? Bugs the tar out of me, just so yeah, you know. I'm like, pretty sure you never went to somebody's spouse to go tell them. No, I would <laughs> never do that. I would never go <laughs> tell somebody's spouse that I think they ought to do what their spouse thinks they ought to do. That would be like, quite frankly, the dumbest thing. Because talk about something that would That's not work. Suicide. Yeah, something that A, would not work, and B, is so not my role, right? Yeah? Um, by the way, a lot of times when people are upset with their spouse. Yes, Brett, you have a question? Um, Brett, Blake, sorry, I did that again, yeah? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Call each other, like we have a little circle of calling each other the wrong name. It's uh, good. easy. I good. Brett Seth, Brett calls Seth Blake. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't feel so bad. It's like that section of the room is, has got an issue. Yeah, two Maddies. That's why I call you Madison and you Maddie. Yeah, because I. Kate, Maddie, 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 Kate. Yeah, yeah, Kate, Maddie, Maddie, Kate. Right, yeah. And then Caitlin. It's not fair. Yeah, and Caitlin. Yeah, gosh, you guys. But yes, Blake. Funny you should say that, because actually that's right, right where I was going to go on my notes. Um, this is a, a lot of what I say when people want me to go tell their spouse what they ought to do. What I usually, re I was going to say, this is what I wrote my notes. And it's not usually greatly appreciated when my response is this. Don't say or don't do anything. Just continue to serve your spouse and pray and trust God. Man, people don't like hearing that. Like... 
They want me to fix their spouse or they want God to change their spouse. By the way, just because nobody in this room is married but me, that's a really bad way to like look at your spouse for future reference. How can I change them or how can God use me to change them or how can I ask God to change them? Now, if they're struggling with something that you know they're struggling with and you want God to help them, that's a different story. If it's just something that really irritates you, more likely what's happening is God is more concerned about your heart than your spouse's behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah? <laughs> Being married is a lot of learning to go, oh, guess I better get used to that. Does that make sense? Yeah? And it's not usually very appreciated when I tell people that. Yeah? Well, too bad. <laughs> okay, can I just tell you one for my life? Are we recording? Now my wife will never watch this. I didn't know this about my wife when I married her, but my wife doesn't clean. Like, at all. Like, what I figured out eventually, it's not just that she doesn't clean, she doesn't know how. Like, she doesn't know how to, like, mop a floor run a vacuum, like, <laughs> why are you guys laughing? You don't clean either? What? Oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. But here's what happened to me. Six months into my marriage, I go to my pastor, because I wasn't, well, I guess I was a pastor, but I went to my mentor, and I start griping. What do I do, man? I got, what do I got to do? My wife doesn't clean. How am I going to make her clean? I should start, am I, you know, and I'll never forget, man, I vented for about 15 minutes on how I do all the cleaning, and my wife sits there and watches me and complains, like, are you done yet? <laughs> right, you know? And I'm like, rah, 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 right, you know? And I'll never forget, my manager's like, man, guess you married someone who doesn't clean, huh? <laughs> And now, 25 years later, yeah, guess what I did yesterday? <laughs> Clean the house. Yeah. God has a funny sense of humor, you know what? And quite frankly, I probably deserve it, you know? Like, yeah, like it's probably really good for me to clean the frickin' house, yeah? <laughs> and I'm super not bitter about it. <laughs> he lied. <laughs> but you know what? Time lapse? Oh, John's thing. Time something? Oh, you just, space time. You just talked about yourself. Yeah, and that <laughs> third person. Yeah, time, time, space, continuum lapse. Okay, <laughs> let's finish this up. So then Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Martha. Mine only has two. I know. I added to the scriptures. According to Revelations, that's like a curse, but whatever. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Just like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I love that he says, Martha, Martha, twice. Martha, 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 the Lord answered. You are worried ooh, and upset, and I love this, about many things, <laughs> but only one thing is needed. Man, you should underline all that. Worried, upset, many, and only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Boy, there's so much in that sentence right there. Okay, first of all, I want you to recognize Jesus is not blaming her. He's not scolding her for her service, because she's doing a valuable thing. It's not the act of service, right, that's causing the issue here, right? And then we don't want to get lost, because some people like to say, well, why wouldn't it, couldn't Mary help a little bit, or what, could she sit for a little bit, or da, da, da. That's, not, that's not the point at all, right? What if she asked Mary more gently? No, 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 we're trying to figure out a way around this. No, Jesus speaking right to the heart. The real lesson is this, the worries and the bothers, and this is what I wrote, and the troubles and the scandals and the offense and everything, it's all temporal, right? The reason I say this and the reason why I used all those words, trouble, scandal, offense, and everything, is because, quite frankly, in the church, we always have all that stuff going on at, all, at any given time. There's people that are upset at each other. There's issues in marriages. Uh, somebody uh, cleaned the kitchen which they meant well. This is a true story. They cleaned the kitchen and put everything away differently. They thought it was better organized. And then the person came in and cleaned everything. 
and then called me up to say somebody's stolen all the blah, 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 and da, da, da. And then we, I came down to help look, and then we found the stuff. And then they were upset that the person cleaned without asking if they should clean, right? You think that doesn't happen all the time? It happens all the time, right? All that worry and trouble and whose turn was it to do this and who didn't return the cooler. That's the latest thing. I think we're still missing a cooler. <laughs> that was like the big scandal last week. Where's the third cooler? <laughs> See, we ought to have a lock on the door and a sign out sheet and you have to give a drop of your blood to get a cooler, right? You think I'm joking? This is like, this is like people like lose their minds over the fact that we've lost a cooler at church, right? And we have to write emails and make phone calls and settle people down about, don't worry, if we don't find the cooler, we'll buy another one. And yeah, but they're expensive. I know, I know. They're, yeah, da, da, da. All that stuff, it's just temporal, super temporary. It comes and it goes, good days, bad days, but Christ is forever. And the root of our service to him must come from a heart that knows and loves Jesus. And he is the priority above all. When I talk about losing the plot, that is the plot. Jesus is the plot. Our service to him is the plot. And I know you guys know this verse already. I didn't write it down. But, you know, somewhere in scripture, I forget where it is. Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord, right? Where is that? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? No, 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 no. It's like, I think it's when Paul's talking about whether you eat or drink, right? Oh. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it as yeah, unto. That might be Jesus might say that on the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I was thinking of what Paul says when he's talking about food sacrifice to idols. And he says the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of eating and drinking. But, um, but what is it? <laughs> you think that would be something good to know, huh? It's about, um, I forget what it is. Anyways, it's for him. Okay, so this is, this is my final quote, and then I'll get to some quick applications. Out of all the things we do for him, the only thing that we really need ultimately is, okay. So here's why um, this is important. Ministry guys can be the worst, quite frankly. Why? Well, because we get super busy, busy, busy doing stuff for church, for the kingdom, right? And if you're going to go into ministry someday, I'm looking around the room at all you future ministry people, you got to be really careful about this because busy, busy, busy in the kingdom. I got stuff to do. Get up in the morning. Ah, do I have time to have my quiet time today? Nah, I got so much stuff I got to do. And the stuff, I, you can justify it because the stuff I'm doing it's for the kingdom. It's for Jesus. Therefore, being busy is a good thing, right? But you've got to be careful and make sure you make time to feed your soul, especially when you're busy, busy, busy um, in the kingdom. Now, um, I don't suffer too badly from this. In fact, um, we, had that, um, we had a staff retreat a couple of weeks ago, right after you guys left McConnellani. We went up there for the staff retreat. And it was kind of funny because at one point, the guy who was the, um, what do you call it, the speaker at our staff retreat, he is the executive pastor of a mega church in Las Vegas. So picture a church of like 10,000 people, right? You know what the executive pastor does? He's the administrator. So he has a staff, are you ready for this, of 60 people that he oversees, right? Now imagine all the, the salary and stress and money and payments and job descriptions and hiring and firing and job performance reviews and that kind of thing. And this is what he said to us. He goes, he goes, man, I know how you guys are all, I know how easy it is for you all to become burned out. He goes, because we've all sort of adopted that, that 80s corporate growth model. We're growing the church is like the number one thing. And I didn't say anything, but you know what I thought to myself? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I don't really have that 80s growth, corporate, grow the church mentality. I'm kind of blessed that way. I'm kind of a lazy sack, actually, you know? I don't, I don't literally sit around thinking all day, how can we grow our church from 500 to 1,000? And once we get to 1,000, how do we, like, you know, open another church and make it? and get? How do we make KCF 10,000 people? I just don't have it in me. I know Rick kind of thinks like that, right? 
My, Rick might have like really got blessed by that. But me, I'm like, oh, what do I got to do today? Right? So my point is, <clears throat> what is my point? Yeah. Oh, be careful that you feed your soul with whatever you've got to do. Um, I was talking to my kids about this before, and I think it's a great lesson for you guys. And I might have shared this with you already. In fact, I probably have, so I'm just going to share it again. But you should divide your day into thirds, right? And not equal thirds, not equal thirds, but just three things. You need to feed your mind, your body, and your soul, right? Now, feeding your mind at Anchor House, pretty simple. This is it right here. You're doing it right now, right? You're feeding your mind, right? And actually, it's pretty much kind of feeding your soul, right? But a big important part of feeding your soul is being alone with God a little bit. So spend a little time alone with God. And by the way, this is good for you guys to know when you leave Anchor House. Because when you leave Anchor House, you, you won't have like a designated time to sit and study or sit under God's word. But you're going to have to learn, and I know a lot of you guys do this already, so I shouldn't say you're going to have to learn, but I want to remind you it's important to feed your soul the rest of your life. So, you know, for example, like if you hang out with John Enns, you know, John Enns listens to Bible Project podcasts almost like obsessively. Do you know he's listened to every single Bible Project podcast? There's like hundreds of them. Yeah. 900 of them. Yeah. He's heard all of them. That's insane. But I got to tell, tell you, I do this too. Like I jump in my car and I'm driving to Lahui. Yeah, I'm listening to the latest Bible Project podcast. Does that make sense? Even if it has nothing to do with something I'm going to be teaching you guys or whatever, you should get in the habit of feeding your soul in your life and then take care of your physical body as well. That means eat right, get good sleep, yeah, and get exercise. Feed your body, feed your mind, and feed your soul. Um, now there's... Um, how much time we got? We're almost out of time. Okay, let me just be real quick about this. Um, <laughs> there's what I call proactive learning, and this is why John MacArthur like, had a conniption with this story. He's like, see, the, clearly the whole point of the believer is to study God's word, right? You know, because that's what she was doing by sitting and listening to his word, right? So he went nuts on that, right? And I get it, and I'm convinced that, like, yes, study the scripture is good, but I also want to submit to you what I call passive learning, like which is what is you're doing right now. And passive learning, I believe, is not only just like sitting in Bible study, going to church, maybe listening to a Bible podcast, but I would add that fellowship with other believers is passive learning, just spending time in community with the body of Christ. And then my last example is almost kind of ironic in the light of today's scripture, but quite frankly, serving God is another way you learn about God. I know that sounds ironic because that's what Martha was doing, but my point is serving God wasn't what the problem was. It was her attitude about it. She's got sitting right there, God incarnate. Jesus is there. And she's so busy, she's buzzing around and not hearing a word he says. What does that look like in your life? If you're around church, maybe around Christians, but you're not hearing from God. You're not spending time sitting at his feet, letting him speak to you, being with Jesus, then you're no better than a Martha, Martha, Martha. So I'll wrap up with this idea. It's a, it's a danger for anybody who serves the Lord. And notice how she loses her joy. She has no joy in what she's doing because she's lost, um, she's lost um, the plot, so to speak, yeah? And, uh, you know, I joke about Ed. Um, why are you guys talking when there's work to do? When we're actually fellowshipping and enjoying each other's company, right? Which is one way that we enjoy Jesus, right? He'd kind of lost the plot. And I joke about it, but it can be a serious problem. And every once in a while, by the way, this doesn't happen very often. Me and Siri got a thing going on. <laughs> All I got to say, yeah, yeah. That was kind of embarrassing, Siri. Just keep it to yourself. Okay, this is kind of funny because, um, quite frankly, as a pastor, we usually have the opposite problem. And that is what we want to do is get in front of the church and say, could everybody get off their acole and do something around here, right? You guys know what acole is? Your butt. Get off your butt and do something. But I will tell you this. Every once, in fact, it just happened um, last month. Every once in a while, believe it or not, 
we, one of the pastors, will go to somebody and say, you need to slow down. Isn't that interesting? You need to, like, take a break. Isn't that weird? It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. We'll actually tell somebody, could you stop? Stop volunteering. We're getting a little worried about you. Like, you are working yourself to death for the kingdom. And there seems to be, like, an almost angst about you. Does that make sense? Like, as if you're maybe trying to earn God's favor or, I don't know, you're, like, frantic. And we'll say, you're not allowed to, like, volunteer for a month. How's that, yeah? Pretty rare, but it does happen. It's easy to be distracted even by service. So check your heart. Okay, with one minute left to go, two minutes left to go. Anybody have a question or a comment? Yes, Cooper. Just a quick the verse I think you're looking for is 1 Corinthians 10.31. Could you read it, please? Yeah, so whether you eat or drink or whether you do, do all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God, yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's who we're serving, yeah. Doesn't matter if Martha's helping or Mary's helping or nobody's helping. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for Jesus. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? <laughs> it's Friday. What do you guys got going tomorrow? Cleaning? Cleaning! Yeah! <laughs> Love the attitude. <laughs> That's next week. You guys going you guys going to one day Bible school? Yeah. Cool. By the way, it was so funny. I was talking to Nate. I said, I don't know if they, the Anchor House guys, uh, I figured they're probably going to want to you know, go to one-day Bible school. And he goes, well, some might want to go, and some might kind of be like, man, like we've been in class all week. And just so you know, I totally forgot. I wasn't even thinking that. And I had to admit, Nate had a point. If you don't go to one-day Bible school, I don't blame you whatsoever. Freak, you're like in one-day Bible school every day of the week. Like the people that are going to one-day Bible school like haven't been one day for the whole year. Does that make sense? So anyways, I get it. If you don't want to come, like, I totally get it. I hadn't even thought about that. I'm like, oh, yeah, you guys are, like, every day in one-day Bible school. Yes. You had your hand up, Lexi? I'll ask you after. Okay. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this lesson, Lord. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for Martha. Thank you for the easy devotional lesson today, Lord, for us to sit at your feet, um, to be aware of the distractions of the world. That's a good word, distractions of the world, whether they be distractions that we're serving you or we're just screwing around on our phone or whatever, God, getting away from the distractions of the world and spending time at your feet, Lord, because you are the most important thing, the everlasting thing. Everything else is just going to pass away. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.